Hi there, I'm Jen. This is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a partial wrap up of some of the things that I've read recently. I'm going to save some poetry for a different video because I think I'm going to talk about translated poetry in general and uh, use a couple of these as an example. So if you follow me on either Goodreads or Instagram, you'll have seen a couple of things that I won't be talking about now, but eventually. Because it's Women in Translation Month, a lot of the things that I've been reading are by Women in Translation, but there are three that were not, so I thought I'd start with those. Uh, first up is a book that I listened to the audio version of, and that is Justin Ling's Missing from the Village, and it is narrated by the author himself. I've seen this described as true crime, but it is really more of a, a portrait of everything that went wrong and the biases at play with everything that went wrong when the Toronto police were investigating the serial killer that was operating in the gay village 10 years ago and then onwards for years and years until he was caught. Ling was one of the investigative reporters who had, who had actually been working on the story from the early days. So he's not really going back and doing a portrait of who Bruce MacArthur the serial killer was. He does talk a little bit about his backstory, but he spends an equal amount of time on the life stories of each of the victims and also on other people in the community. He talks about other killings that were never solved and that, I mean, no one knows it could have even been the same guy because that case has been closed so they're not looking for additional things. Like he could have killed more than eight people. And then it goes even back even further and he talks about a lot of the homophobia in policing going back in Toronto, going back decades, racial and class biases that were at play that meant that certain murders, if, if a homeless guy disappeared, he, that murder was not going to be investigated as well as someone else. If, if a recent immigrant disappeared, was that going to be investigated as clearly? So it's less true crime than, than almost an indictment of the Canadian policing system and how it failed these people because this guy who committed the murders, because the murderer did turn out to be someone that the police had brought in for interviews relatively early on in his killing career. I don't know what is that what you call that. So, I mean, it is horrific to listen to. I don't know how interesting it would be if you had followed this closely at the time it was happening. I wasn't living in Toronto at the time, so I really only heard about it right at the end, whereas I think people who were in the community were more aware of the various missing people and would have read some of Ling's articles when they were coming out originally and so on. So a lot of this was new to me or things that it, if you hear it in the national news later, as opposed to in the local news, I think some of the, these things were reported not quite, not as accurately as they could have been. So, so some of that was interesting to have clarified because I had definitely had some assumptions about this case that weren't exactly correct. So yeah, it is massively depressing because you do think about how just everybody in this situation was failed terribly. It's awful. But yeah, I think if you are interested in this case, it's certainly worth picking up, but it is not in the style of true crime where you're inside the head of a killer. It's not taking that kind of angle at all. It is very clearly looking at the investigation. And actually it was interesting in terms of seeing how investigative reporting works too. So that was all good stuff. This is an Olympic dream, the story of Samina Yusuf Omar, which was written by Reinhard Kleist and, and translated by Ivanka Hanenberger. This is a biography of the Somali runner who, who represented Somalia at the Beijing Olympics and wanted to compete in London as well. And because of the political state of the area, part of Somalia that she was in, she wasn't able to safely train. So she tried to move to another city to train, but they were only training men. So she attempted to escape to Europe over the Mediterranean and she drowned during the crossing. And I mean, it's a gutting story. This is a, a graphic biography. And the art style is black and white, stripped down, very serious, I would say. The issue here is that the author, aware that as a German man, he doesn't have the intimate kind of cultural knowledge as he's telling the story, but is so careful in not overstepping that he makes this feel very generic. Reading this, I didn't feel like I was getting anything that you wouldn't get just from reading the Wikipedia page, or there's a, a documentary, a very short Dutch documentary on YouTube that you can watch. And a graphic biography like this has the potential to give so much more to the story, but he is so cautious in how he portrays everything and in the notes about what interviews happened and where he came up with the information and everything that 
as a work on its own, it just, it feels very generic. So that was a bit disappointing. I did read this during the Olympics, so it was uh, on theme for that, but yeah. It's a story that's worth hearing about because unfortunately there are so many stories of people drowning in the Mediterranean that I think it's kind of useful to have not just a face, but a face of you know, somebody who went to the Olympics and was still, still ended up dying in that way. But uh, yeah, it, it's just disappointing because there's so much more potential for that form to have produced something else. Having almost the opposite problem is this novel Seven by Farzana Doctor. This is the author of Six Meters of Pavement, which was one of my favorite, well, favorite Canadian novels, but favorite novels in general of the past 10 years, I'd say. So I was hyped for this, although her most more recent novel, All Inclusive, I liked kind of the style of it, but I wasn't a huge fan. It was a bit too sex driven for me, um, although stylistically it was interesting. But in any case, this book sort of similarly takes a bunch of literary fiction tropes, if you will, and commercial fiction stylistic choices and merges them together to tell what is part one part family story and one part a critique of Kutna, which is the form of uh, female genital cutting that happens in the Bora community. This is about a woman in the US who has a Canadian husband. They go to India because her husband is, is a guest lecturer at a university for eight months. And she's reconnecting with her cousins and, and also looking into the life of her great, great, great grandfather. We also get some flashbacks to the life of that great, great, great grandfather. And that is the part that leans more towards the literary style. I, I hate that label, but I don't have a better way to describe it for this. And then there is also a section that deals with her relationship issues with her husband and how she'd had an emotional affair and they have sex problems. And those two things are interwoven with this story about the genital cutting practice and the emotional repercussions of that. And that's an interesting thing to be doing, but it felt like there was too much. It felt very everything plus the kitchen sink in this book. And I thought, I mean, in part it was too sex driven for me. I didn't care that much about her and her husband's sex lives. But I mean, that's just not to my taste. Somebody else might enjoy that. However, the the bit with the emotional affair and there's some descriptions of what, how, what everybody's wearing and the cousin's lives. And it felt like some of that needed to be stripped out. It felt like this was a book that was a little too long and that, I don't know, in, in order to try to present as balanced a community portrait as possible, there's almost too much left in because it does feel very careful that there's always one person who's arguing one side and one person who's arguing the other or one person who's done something bad but she thought it was okay or she, you know, she rationalized it this way. And it's very balanced that way, which I think is admirable in the sense that she clearly doesn't want to throw, you don't want to throw your community under the bus. But at the same time, reading it, it is a little tedious because you do feel like, why am I hearing this again? Also, there are too many descriptions of food and clothes. And in any case, it is interesting because having that merging of styles and different things weaving together is an interesting way of tackling things. So I would still recommend this if you're interested in it, but just be aware there's a lot of sex driven elements to it. All right, so let's talk about women in translation. We'll start with something light. If you've been around for a while, you'll have heard me talk about this series before. I read volume 15 of What Did You Eat Yesterday by Fumi Yoshinaga. This is a cuisine manga series in which we follow this 50 something gay couple in Tokyo who both have elderly parents and they are trying to save for their own retirement. And in order to do that, they cook at home with whatever is on sale. So we get the plots about their lives. The one guy's parents are starting to look at retirement homes and he's going with them to see retirement homes. The other one has just become manager at the salon where he works and he's trying to work out uh, having to take over those kind of responsibilities. It's very normal people problems and then recipes. And I always find this charming because so many cuisine manga series and just foodie comics in general are so high class and fancy restaurant cooking and they're not things you would ever make. So that's fun for a, a fantasy element, but it's kind of delightful to read something and go, yeah, I could make that very easily and very cheaply. So this continues to be charming. I can't talk a lot about the plot because it is volume 15, but if you are charmed by a slice of life and you like to cook, I cannot recommend that series highly enough. It's 
fantastic. And this was translated by Jocelyn Allen. The rest of the books that I have read so far that are by women in translation are also all by women from countries in the former Yugoslavia because a couple of people that I'm connected with on Instagram are running an ex-Yugoslav literature month this month, so I thought I would combine them. Um, one of the things I read as a poetry collect was translated from Macedonian that I will talk about if I make this poetry video, but I do have a book of short stories and a novel that I'll talk about here. The collection of short stories is called Mars. This is by Asha Bakic and translated by Jennifer Zobel. The stories in here are primarily either near future science fiction or kind of fabulism urban fantasy type work. Uh, it, some of them are the kind of things that if they were set in South America instead of Southeastern Europe, you'd call it magical realism, that kind of thing. And a number of them actually start out as though they are realistic, and then you have sudden clone, sudden cyborg, sudden dystopia, a sudden magic. Many of the characters in here are either writers or journalists. I am frequently on the fence about writers writing about writing, but when it turns out into writer becomes a zombie, then I'm entertained. <laughs> so I thought for the most part these are pretty fun. I think a lot of them end at a point that you almost don't expect a story to end, which uh, in my experience is very more of an East European kind of story setting than you see in books from Western Europe or kind of the Anglosphere. So that was kind of fun because this style of here is something very familiar and then boom, magical stone or boom, android. Uh, is pretty entertaining. I mean, it is not, uh, I would say most of this is, it doesn't feel particularly upbeat. So if you're looking for a kind of light and hopeful science fiction, that's not what this feels like. It is, I wouldn't say pessimistic because science fiction really can't be pessimistic because you assume that there's a future that exists, right? But it is more, uh, it's definitely not hopeful. Unless your hope is just that the future exists, which maybe it is. In that case, maybe it is hopeful. But uh, yeah, it, uh, it is very interesting. And I guess Not Hopeful leads me into the book that I am currently reading. This is depressing. This is S by Slavinka Draculic, which was translated by, who translated this? Which is translated by Marko Ivic. This is gutting. This novel opens, it's the early 90s. We meet a Bosnian woman in a hospital in Sweden and she's giving birth to a child. And this is not a spoiler, it's the first chapter. The, and this is a child that was conceived in one of the rape camps during the war. And the rest of the novel is us flashing back to her experience being taken prisoner, being used in the rape camp and witnessing a lot of horrors and torture and other things that are happening in the general prison camp. Yeah, it's horrific. I'm not quite finished this, but yeah, it's gutting. I mean, it's, it's fiction, but if you've read any of the the history or the first-hand accounts of this, it's, it's all things that have actually happened and she, they're kind of being embodied in this character who is just called S. None, none of the characters in this get names, they have single initials, but the original title in Croatian is actually, is something that translates to more like as if I'm gone and that's it, it's as if She's left herself and doesn't have a name or identity or anything anymore. Yeah. I think this is well done, although there are a couple of points where I did feel like it was similar enough to first-hand accounts that I had read where the person will then stops talking and there's something hanging in the air and she is sort of filled in the blank in that. And, and that's the kind of thing that I'm always slightly uncomfortable with because it's not technically a real person's story, but it is so based in real people's story that I do think, go read the first-hand accounts, but it is still like, it. this is well done and it's incredibly moving and all of that. But uh, it is the kind of book where I think if this were written 30 years in the future, where we were more than 50 years away from this, it would be, it would feel different, but it's now and I'm like, I don't know. But in any case, it's very well done. But if you have read a lot of the real stories, I, I think there are some moral questions about story ownership in that that maybe you do or don't think about when you read something like that. But uh, yeah, highly recommended, especially if you haven't read any of the first-hand accounts, although not if 
rape stories are gonna traumatize you because obviously that is what this is about and it is horrific. So that is some of the non-poetry that I've read lately. If you've read any of these, I'd love to hear what you thought. If you are focusing on a particular country or region for Women in Translation Month, I'd love to hear what you've been reading or what you are reading. And yeah, that's it for now. Ciao.